introduce you to, for those that don't know him, Andrew Bridgen, who is the sitting MP for Leicestershire North West. Right. Can you hear me at the back? You can, yeah. can't we? Don't need, we don't need the microphone. So, yes, I'm Andrew Bridgen. I'm the independent Member of Parliament for North West Leicestershire. Uh, I've been elected under the Conservative banner four times in my constituency. My constituency is my home. And I think I've always been independent, really. Uh, I didn't come through the normal sort of C uh, CCHQ route for being an MP. In fact, the Conservative Party told me when I wanted to stand for North West Leicestershire that no Conservative can ever win in that seat. Uh, we're not giving you any money, uh, and you're on your own. The council have been Labour since its formation in 1983, and uh, the sitting Labour MP David Taylor was seen as, as unbeatable. But I'm a local guy, and uh, I was a local businessman as well. It was my home area, and uh, so I put my own money into it. And I had a group of friends, we used to go down to the local pub, and they were all small and medium-sized business owners and entrepreneurs, and they all moaned on a Friday about how bad the area was. Everything's terrible. So I said, well, and it must have been one pint of Marston's pedigree too many. And I said, look, every Friday we come here and you're all moaning. Nothing's right. The country's going down the tubes. Does all this sound familiar? This is back in 2005. Um, so I said, look, you stand for the council. You stand, you stand, you stand, you stand, you stand, you stand, you stand. I'll put the money up for the leaflets. I'll stand for MP and we'll take over and we'll sort it all out in North West Leicestershire. And there should really, in the, in the Green Man pub in Clifton Campbell, which is actually just over the border in Staffordshire, there really should be a plaque on the wall and it should say, the rise of North West Leicestershire and the fall of Gordon Brown started here with Andrew Bridgen and his plotters. And every one of my friends in that pub that night and their partners, they all stood for the council. The local Conservative Association was so moribund, I had 55 members when I uh, became the prospective parliamentary candidate. I ran the local elections in 2007 and the Conservative Party had never put up a full <coughs> list of candidates. And they've never had a candidate in every ward in, in, in the constituency. And uh, I fell out with the association, ran the campaign myself and funded it myself. And uh, the Conservative Party were rather surprised that uh, you know, if you actually put candidates up in every ward, people might vote for you. Mm. So the Conservative Central Office were rather surprised when the biggest swing in the country in the local election in 2007 was in a place called North West Leicestershire, where after 40 years of Labour control of the council, we took them down to five councillors in one night. <laughs> David Taylor, the much-loved Labour MP, who was another local guy, but, uh, Christian socialist, he wasn't a bad man, and uh, he cried that night, and within six months he announced he wasn't going to stand because he was going to, to lose. And I was gutted in the 2010 election, uh, in the seat that the Conservative Party had said we could never win, um, that I only had the second biggest swing in the country against Labour, turning a 4,500 Labour majority into 7,500 with a 12.5% swing on the night. Now, North West Leicestershire was the most deprived seat in Leicestershire. We have Colville, which is the most deprived town in Leicestershire. And a previous Conservative MP, many, many eons ago, had suggested changing the name of Colville. I thought that was a stupid idea. So what I started to do was to change Colville for the better. So, I had the poorest seat in, 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 in Leicestershire. And I'm pleased to say that it took me ten years and I have the richest seat in Leicestershire. We bought in... The previous Labour administration was so corrupt, they used to want 2% out of all planning commissions. There were, there were whole, most, most architects and businesses did not want to put planning permission in North West Leicestershire. We cleared all those planning officers out and we'd cleared out the Labour councillors who were 
who were perpetrating that. And um, North West Leicester, I don't know if you know, it's the very centre of population of the UK. Yeah. Two miles, two hours, lorry, four hours lorry drive in any direction from North West Leicester, which is also Ashby de Lazouche's in my constituency. That's the town furthest from us seen in any direction. So we are Middle England. Four hours lorry drive from North West Leicester, so you've got like 83% of all chimney pots in the UK. So if you want a big shed and you want to deliver all over the UK, North West Leicestershire is the place to be. And it just happens that so a third of all the jobs are in distribution or distribution related. We've got the airport, we've got East Midlands Airport, we've got the M1, we've got the M42, we've got the A50. And we are the place that distribution hubs want to come to. We've got more fork trucks and lorry drivers than you could shake a stick at. And it just happened, luck would have it, that they have the only MP in North West Leicestershire who's a qualified transport manager, which most of the people in my constituency work in that industry. And we've played to our strengths. We now have 1.2 jobs in the constituency for everyone of working age in the constituency, so we're a, a net um, bringer in of businesses. 40% of the top 100 businesses in Leicestershire are in the one seat of North West Northwest Leicestershire, and my, my majority increased with the prosperity of the area, so that in the four elections I've stood in, I've increased my majority at every single election, uh, my percentage of the vote, my majority and my vote, and at the last election, having led the Leave campaign for the East Midlands and the so-called Get Brexit Done 2019 election, despite there being six candidates on the ballot paper, I managed to achieve 63% of the vote mm. in a seat that David Cameron said we could never win. And I was particularly pleased, because David Cameron had left the Commons by then, that I actually had a bigger majority than they had in Whitney. <laughs> well, if, if, if my seat was a dump, I said my seat was a dump, what a dump the Cotswolds must be if they can't return <laughs> a, a big stonking majority. So I'd always been a bit of an independent. They had no hold of me. And then within weeks of being elected, I was exposed to the Horizon Post Office scandal with Mr. Mr. Rudkin, who's got very famous now, the actor playing him, the man who was representing all the sub-postmasters in the UK, went down to Fujitsu's headquarters, they showed him how they were fiddling all the Horizon uh, accounts in all the sub-postmasters' post offices without them knowing, making corrections to errors. He came out of there and he told me this story within weeks of being elected. And it sounded like a conspiracy theory, didn't it? But it had a ring of truth about it. And he told me that he left, he was thrown out of Fujitsu's headquarters when they realised who he was. They'd mistaken him for someone else. They'd shown him everything. And he went home, back to Ibstock, where his wife was looking after the, 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 the post office for him while he was doing these national duties. And he was thinking about what he'd seen and how it contradicted everything that the post office had ever said in court with his members. He went to bed and woke up the next morning and there's a post office inspector knocking on the door and he shouted up to him, you're £44,000 short overnight and you're going to prison. They had deliberately targeted that man, unless you think it's a coincidence that the day after he uncovered everything that was going on at Fujitsu, the next morning his wife had got a £44,000 and he was ruined. And I saw him about two years after that, when I was elected, and I saw two broken people in front of me. And I thought, why would they come and tell me that they're convicted criminals? Why would they come and tell me this story? They're raking everything up. <coughs> they had a previously blemishless track record of honesty. You can't be a sub-postmaster as you pass all these tests. You can't have a criminal record. What was in it for them? So I started making a few investigations. This is back in 2010. I asked of other colleagues in the House of Commons, have you had anybody prosecuted by the post office who previously had a blemishless record who claims that they didn't do it, they didn't take the money? And mysteriously did. We, find we had five MPs, um, and there's only myself and Kevin Jones from Durham who are still left in the Commons from those five MPs. The investigator who we managed to get into the post office was my man. Ron Warmington of Second Sight was my recommendation. You will notice I was written out of the, of the, of the programme, but I ran that campaign. And if you look back in Hansard, nine years ago, 
everything that was in that TV program exposing what what Fujitsu and the post office has done to the sort of most postmasters, it's on the record because I said it in a speech in the House of Commons. So everything that Mr. Rudkin had told me turned out to be a hundred percent true. We had an establishment who'd worked against him. They covered up. The government knew. The post office knew. They certainly all knew by 2014. I knew. And equally shockingly, I went to every media outlet in 2014 with the evidence, the BBC, the ITV, Channel 4 News, Sky News, the Telegraph, the Times, all the newspapers, and said, look, run this story. You'll get an award. This is the biggest miscarriage of justice in the UK's history. You'll get an award if you run this story. And to a man and a woman, every one of those journalists quite like the story. They quite like the thought of winning an award. But every one of their head offices, their uh, editors, stopped them running the story. And we're seeing that again and again and again. Rotherham. Rotherham, Hillsborough, the vaccine harms, the excess deaths, the net zero, the WHO insurance, all the things I'm talking about in Parliament now that nobody wants to talk about. These are things that are going to affect you, your children, and your grandchildren. And none of these things, the way your Parliament is acting, is not that it's going to happen, it's not in your interest. They're not looking after your interests. I've realised this. And I remember, I'll remind you again, you've probably heard me say it, that when I spoke out, I realised what was going on with the vaccines. And what, what pushed me to speak out was that, I, that was when the Medicines and Healthcare Regulatory Authority put in to vaccinate children down to the age of six months. Yeah. People who are at no risk whatsoever, it's not been a healthy child of that age ever died anywhere in the world from mm. COVID-19, but there was clearly a risk from these experimental vaccines. And I spoke out and got a debate on the 13th of December 2022, and I knew that they'd thrown me out the Conservative Party for it. But I knew that I could explain it in a way that even the most pro-vaccine person would realise that there was no risk to those children and there was a risk, however small they thought it was, from those vaccines we shouldn't be giving them to. Now, I spoke out on the 13th of December. We're now living in one of the very few countries in the world that didn't vaccinate down to six months. The government can rubbish what I said. They said I was talking conspiracy theories, mm. but they didn't dare vaccinate down to six months of age in this country. They did in, m in most of the other countries around the world. And if that cost me my political career, then that will be every day of the week. Because that's what we're here for. And unfortunately... <laughs> unfortunately, there are very few colleagues in the House of Commons with the same attitude. The BBC, on the last time they ever interviewed me, they said, why are you willing to sacrifice your career on the hill of vaccine harms? I said, because that's the hill you're killing my people on. That's what's going on. And when I spoke out on the 17th of March, using the government's own data from the ONS, on the number needed to vaccinate, known as the NNV, with the autumn booster, which we're giving to everybody. The autumn booster was going out to everybody. It worked out that, uh, I think it was the healthy 40 to 49 cohort. You had to vaccinate 934,000 of them, just to keep one, from the government's own figures, keep one person out of reporting into a hospital with COVID-19. And with a severe adverse events rate of one in 800, it meant you were going to kill or put into hospital with serious injury 1,150 people just to keep that one person out of hospital with COVID. And that wasn't in intensive care, that was just reporting to hospital saying, I don't feel very well, I think I've got COVID. And again, the government, the government said Andrew Bridge is spouting his conspiracy theories. But if you look, within three weeks, they've restricted the booster campaign only to the over 75s. And again, I think that's saved lives. The government are not looking after you. Parliament is not looking after you. And that is easily demonstrated by the grandee of the Conservative Party. Before I was actually kicked out, after I'd been suspended, I had a meeting with them, I explained for an hour and a half my concerns over 
the vaccine harms, the use of midazolam and morphine on the vulnerable elderly, NICE guideline 163, which I believe was responsible for <coughs> euthanizing tens of thousands of people who were moved out of hospital to make way for the expected first wave of COVID patients, who never came, by the way, the hospitals were empty. They never came, but they created, created the first wave. And after an hour and a half of this, the grandee listened, and I, and I knew this, this person I was speaking with was speaking for the party, and I also knew that his sister had had to go into hospital after the second Pfizer vaccine, I didn't tell him any of this, but that is, is what had happened. He knew everything. And he turned to me at the end of the meeting, well, it became the end of the meeting, when he turned to me and said, Andrew, there is currently no political appetite for your views on the vaccines. There may well be in 20 years' time. And you're probably going to be proved right then. But in the meantime, you need to bear in mind that you're taking on the most powerful vested interest in the world with all the personal risk for you that which that will entail. And I said, thank you very much for listening to me. I'm leaving the meeting now. I guess that's the end of it. And they expelled me from the Conservative Party for that. So I wouldn't cover it up. But look at what's been... This has all been done to you before. You know, the thalidomide crisis. Mm. Thalidomide was suspended in 1961. 60% <clears throat> of the babies, the pregnant women who took it, the babies died. 40% <coughs> were born with horrendous, horrendous disabilities. It was 1972 before the word thalidomide was allowed to be mentioned in the Chamber of the House of Commons and compensation was obtained for those victims who the children were 11, 12, 13 years old by then. And I looked at the ruling from the Strasbourg Court of Human Rights and it actually said in that three judges had come to the conclusion that successive speakers of the House of Commons had deliberately suppressed debate on thalidomide for 11 years. And I put in, I got the first ever debate in any parliament on excess deaths in the world. It took me 26 attempts in the House of Commons to get it. And it was only when I sent the video pointing out that previous speakers had been accused of suppressing debate on thalidomide, a week later I got a debate on excess deaths from Lindsay Hoyle on the 20th of October last year. We've had a, another debate on uh, in Westminster Hall for 90 minutes. I managed to get 17 colleagues to come to that. I've now got 24 signed up for a three-hour debate. We won't get three hours. They won't allow us three hours in the main chamber on the 18th of April in a few weeks' time. Um, the truth is coming out. They're not going to get 20 years cover-up on this. They're not going to get 20 months. But all the political parties are a party to it. They've all got massive uh, political capital tied up in this. They don't want anything breaking before the general election. I think they're going to have to be disappointed because the truth, the truth is like a lion. We don't have to protect it. All we have to do is set it free, and we're going to set it free. Mm -hmm. And I'll set it free on the 18th of April. And if that was all it was, just the vaccines, it, but it's not. Oh, your parliament and every parliament around the world is going to sign its people away, your sovereignty to, these, to the WHO, the World Health Organization. An unelected, unaccountable, non-taxpaying, <coughs> immune from prosecution mm. organisation. So they will be able to call it a public health emergency of international concern or the pandemic for animal pathogens, human pathogens, mm. or a perceived threat to the environment Even anywhere like, in the yeah. world, anywhere in the world, mm. or the risk of any of those things, just a precautionary risk. So we'll just lock you down for a bit. Uh, they're looking at vaccines, mRNA vaccines, in a hundred days. They'll be completely untested, working on the same system we're working, we're working on now, with the same side effects, and they will have the ability to mandate them. I, they, won't, they, won't, they won't say, they're not, they're not obligatory, but you won't better go out the house unless you've had one. Or go to work, or travel, or see your friends. I mean, this is absolute lunacy. It's an abdication of responsibility. This is your sovereignty that your elected representatives will be giving away. I'm, I'm, I don't hold your sovereignty. Your sovereignty has to be returned to you at every election. So you can decide who you want to represent you. It's not for politicians to give this away. We can never... It, the powers that the WHO will have make being in the European Union, and I was a big Brexiteer, uh, look like 
a paragon of virtue and democracy compared to the WHO. This is autocratic dictatorship. Bear in mind, there is not one court anywhere in the world where if, 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 if Dr. Tedros, the Director General of the WHO, made a decision you didn't like, or I didn't like, or anybody around the world didn't like, there is no court anywhere in the world where we could go and say, hold him to account, because that is the level of immunity they have. This is dictatorship. It's so dangerous. And the whole world is sleepwalking into it. That's another thing that my parliament and all the parliaments around the world don't want to talk about. I'm always suspicious. When politicians don't want to talk about something, there's something going on. I guarantee it's not going to be in your interest or your interest or, or my interest. And this is coming fast. So at the end, I think it's the 26th of May, the uh, international, um, the, the treaty called the Pandemic <coughs> Agreement now, which we've never agreed to, that will get probably get a vote by both houses of, of, the, of our parliament, the Commons and the Lords, that's going to go through. Labour are going to back it, the Conservatives are going to back it. They don't want anyone to read the detail. It's horrendous giving these powers away. And even more concerning, the amendments to the International Health Regulations, where they've taken out everything to do with human rights. That's, I mean, these are United Nations human rights. The WHO is an arm of the United Nations. And in that, they've actually taken out all the human rights and it's replaced by a bland statement saying, everybody will be treated with equity. Yeah. The same. Well, I mean, yeah, and if we're treating everyone badly, that's equity, isn't it? And that's, that's, that's what it's going to be. We won't even get a vote on that. We won't even get a vote on it. And the only things we've actually had is two public petition debates in our parliament, one on the uh, pandemic agreement, which got 156,000 supporters, one about 116,000 for the amendments to the international health regulations. We've had those two, two debates and there was a third debate, which I raised in the chamber only a few weeks ago, where the motion was moved with, I think, 104,000 public petition that we should leave the WHO. And, of course, we should. Yeah, yeah. And the petitions uh, committee in the House of Commons decided that we're not going to have a debate on something, despite it having 100-odd thousand qualifying for a debate in the, in the House of Commons. Democracy is from the Greek. Demos is the people and Kratos is power. What we have in this parliament and the parliaments around the world is certainly not democracy. We need, if we can stop what's going on, and I think we can, I think we will. I do not want to be in a position where this can ever be inflicted upon you or me or my children or my grandchildren ever again. And the answer to that is to move to a system where it's going to be a bind. You're going to have to vote in referendums three times a year. But the alternative is we don't want to ever end up in the situation we find ourselves now. And when we've sorted it, we're going to sort it properly. And the answer is going to be direct democracy. And that will be power to the people. Thank you very yeah. much for listening.